Hello. Um, I'd like to thank first Stuart and Amy for inviting me on quite short notice, which is quite fun because I've had to kind of rustle up a talk quite quickly. Um, I'd also like to take a moment just to wish Martina Hoffman well and to say, to express the, the hope that whatever prevented her from being here will clear away and life will continue delightfully. I think that's a really important thing to say. Um, fortunately, for having only a few days to prepare this, I've spent the last year or so writing a book called On Vision and Being Human. Uh, this is the only copy in existence. It's out in autumn. Um, and so what I'd like to do, really, is summarise is the wrong word, because you can't really summarise 340 pages in 20 minutes. But talk a bit about some of the main points. Um, because for me, rising over the last few years, so this isn't really about visionary art, but it is about creativity in a funny kind of way. And the journey that I'm going to use to get there might be unsettling for some people, but I promise the destination is going to be beautiful. So bear with me. Um, as an artist who works with the visionary and the dreamlike and the sacred, it might seem reasonable to assume that I'm quite concerned with the question, what is visionary art? It's really strange to say, but hand on my heart, I'm not that bothered about the answer to that question. I think there are many people, uh, some of whom are here today, um, who have given really good answers to that question. What really interests me is the phenomenon that visionary art seeks to depict. Okay. And it then allows us to kind of think about a new question, which is, what is a vision? So if visionary art is quite simply the art of visions, dreams, transpersonal and transcultural experiences, what do those words mean? And this has occupied my thinking for uh, a great deal of time. And like many quintessential human phenomena, it's much easier to describe, especially in 20 minutes, it's much easier to describe its properties than try and provide a definition that doesn't depend on analogy with other human experiences, like language, like consciousness, like creativity. What is a vision in and of itself? And that's such a challenging question. One of the principal properties of visionary experience, it seems to me, is that it appears to provide an experiential or evidential report into a hidden reality. A sensation that Rudolf Otto termed wholly other. And by the way, what you see here is just a visual accompaniment to what I'm saying. So, Something that Rudolf Otto termed wholly other, a condition absolutely sui generis coming out from itself and incomparable to everyday reality, whereby the human being finds himself utterly abashed. I think that's a great way to describe visionary experience, something that completely leaves you abashed, empty of words. Those of us who regularly experience visions, whether they're psychedelic, whether they're spontaneous, or in my case, a lot of them come from things like migraines and other neurological glitches, you may recognize the territory, and this hidden reality seems to have many names. The world beyond worlds, the kingdom of God, the ultimate ground of being, the platonic world of forms. It is wholly unlike the real world of the everyday, and it's very often hyper-real. I think we can all resonate with that kind of description. It is infused with an imminent supernatural energy, and it shimmers with animism, light and presence, whereby every action, every event, every moment is suffused with meaning and intentionality. It shapeshifts. Deities fused with archetypes, externalized mythical images suddenly become embodied in the subject, the visionary. These attributes of otherness and of coming from a hidden reality, from animism, of supernatural power and intentionality, are ubiquitous enough in visionary experiences to constitute essential aspects. But each one of them is problematic in the 21st century in one form or another. 
This is where it starts to get uncomfortable because this is what I call the visionary elephant in the room. It's the thing that I see and it seems to me that perhaps other people are seeing it but we're not giving word to it in the, the way perhaps might clarify some of the problems. Now my academic background originally, long before I became an artist, was quantum mechanics. So I've done the maths, I've done the experiments and let me tell you something the popular view of quantum mechanics is not what you think it is. It's actually much, much, much stranger, much more unsettling for the human psyche. I've, in my book, I call it maddening. And it is this. There is an objective reality. It is the real world, for want of a better word. But that objectivity is not fundamental. It's a surface feature, it's emergent, and arising from a morass of non-conscious quantum interactions. Those quantum interactions are themselves based on no essence, no fundamental nature. It's founded upon indeterminacy, a lack of what is called realism, and no a priori foundational characteristic. There is a void under reality, and its nature is completely absent. So, as humans, we go, well, an electron is both a wave and a particle, but, you know, which one is it really? You know, underneath. It's got to be something secretly, hasn't it? It's not either of those things. And the human psyche just goes, no, 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 no. It's not either of those things. And it's not anything other than those things. This is not very amenable as a picture of reality to this visionary idea of hidden realities. Modern evidential inquiry has also found no real sign of deity and no sense of a supernatural energy within the universe. And so we start talking about non-materiality. But there it seems to be no Shakti or Kundalini, no mana or Ngom, as they, the Bushmen say. What then is to be done with this situation? This is a real problem for 21st century humanity because on the one hand we've got science, which we can't really deny. We can modify and we can look at it in different ways. But we've also got our experience, which we also cannot deny. And in the past century or so, two dominant paradigms, I think, have presented themselves as a, as a solution to the issue. And they're both kind of unsatisfactory. The first is dismissal. Rational, and a rational dismissal. Visionary experience, along with deities and all notions of supernatural energy, animism and cosmic intentionality, are to be rejected as irrational, meaningless, generally delusional, and anathema to a proper 21st century consideration of the human. This is problematic not just in the modern way. I mean, we can think about Richard Dawkins here and his, his book, The God Delusion. But actually, for about two and a half thousand years, Western humanity's primary responsibility has not been to a conception of eternity. It's not been to the repetition of exemplary, primordial, or mythical actions. It's to history. And if you're responsible to history and actions within that history, then to experience visions is to lose yourself in fantasy. This isn't a satisfactory solution. The second paradigm is a kind of literalism. The individual contents of vision might be local to a culture or particular to an individual or speak of something collective, but basic visionary properties are considered as absolutely real, that they really do represent evidential reports from a hidden reality. This is problematic, too, in the light of this other side of us that suggests that these things don't appear to be evident. We get this kind of situation where we lose authenticity in what we are doing. People talk about pseudoscience, almost as if to say science from a religious perspective, but in a lot of contemporary science writing, you also have pseudo-religion. If you read the work of Richard Dawkins and his characterization of religion is as strange as some of the pseudo-science that he seeks to reject. 
Between these two ideas, dismissal and literalism, there doesn't seem to be any kind of ready compromise. And in the last few years, I've been starting to believe that the shape of a solution isn't going to be compromise. Um, in the modern West, we do seem to like our contemporary antagonisms. Choose your side, pick a fight, stand your ground, express yourself through opposition to what you oppose. I don't think this is a really good way forward for understanding our humanity in, in the 21st century. And I'm starting to think that new information is needed to effect some kind of transcendence of the issue. I'm kind of leaving these pictures behind, sorry. There is one facet of human behavior which I believe has precisely this property of this strange 21st century transcendence. And it is symbolic cognition. It's a thing from anthropology or maybe evolutionary psychology. And these fields notice that as soon as humans appear on the scene, as soon as kind of in the middle stone age of Africa, we appear on the scenes, we start doing some really strange things that have nothing to do with functional actions. We make these hand axes that are like 30 centimeters tall. They're just not big enough. They're just too big for, for um, practical use. We, until about 10,000 years ago, we seem to have an almost pathological obsession with red ochre, which is a substance that has no functional use. It's purely symbolic and appears to have been used mostly for body painting. Why would a particularly intelligent primate be interested in painting its body? What, 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 what's behind that? At length, we begin to create geometric designs in body paint and on the, the ochre itself. And handprints on rock surfaces seem to express a desire in Paleolithic art to make contact and be intimate with something unseen, which is understood to be beyond the rock surface. Kind of getting onto kind of hidden reality. Now, symbolic culture has been termed by Chris Knight as an environment of objective facts whose existence depends entirely on subjective belief. This is one of those statements for me that takes a lot of unpacking and it communicates kind of deeply, not with a rational image of the human or, or an experiential image of the human, but just really about the paradox of what it is to be alive as one of us. It's also been called an unseen world of reference. And I tend to call it the art of seeing something unreal or collectively unreal towards a deeper truth. And that for me is a, a paradox upon paradoxes, but it, it's kind of who we are as a, a human being. And it's both automatic and volitional. And symbolic cognition is specifically, you know, we talk about language and culture and tool use as what separates from the animals. If there's anything that does separate for us from the animals and from previous species of humans like Neanderthals, it is symbolic cognition. It is the capacity to think of something unreal, collectively share it, to the point where we all kind of capture an image. And the best example I can think of that is unicorn. And I've just put an image in all of your heads there that's going to be very, very specific. But have you ever, whilst awake, seen a unicorn with your eyes? You may have seen it on TV, or in a painting, or in dreams and visions. But that white horse in a forest with a horn, you seen a wild one, you know? So that's a, a kind of interesting thing for me. Now, symbolic cognition appears to be founded principally on the pre prefrontal cortex, right here. There's a reason we humans have got a nice high forehead. This cortex mediates our ability to plan, conceptualize, symbolize, and form abstract ideas. It also controls physiological drives and turns basic feelings into complex emotions. And quite strangely, it's only been around for about 250,000 years, this prefrontal cortex, but in that time, it sent out connections across the whole of the brain to the point where we've got a kind of top-down processing of our, of our cognition. Uh, that favors symbolic functions over most other things. Now, this top-down approach is not just seen in, in the individual, in our neurology, but in society, too. And symbolic culture and constructs are reified very often through ritual 
and collective action, which generates trust. Trust is really important in humanity because primates are Machiavellian. It means that they're, 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 they're very often their intelligence okay, is very much about what I can get out of the situation for myself. And in that kind of situation, it's very difficult to understand how language, symbolic culture, art, and other kind of coded signals could ever really evolve. Engagement with fictional constructs and counter-reality can't really operate in these, in these uh, Machiavellian situations. And sexually selective displays, so rituals that perceptually verify how fit I am, can ambiguously combine with early symbolic dramas, enacting in the body unseen worlds. And we see a lot of this in indigenous contexts, where many of the deities appear able to be embodied in a way that in the Western tradition no one can ever become Christ, but it's quite possible in many indigenous traditions for a ritual action to embody uh, a deity. So while symbolic culture and cognition is largely based upon human realities, from a subjective point of view, visionary and religious experience makes the symbolic unseen world of reference visible. So again, we get this kind of virtuous circle of kind of a symbol, a vision makes that sim unseen symbol visible, and that generates trust in the original symbol because it's now visible, and it then can kind of further develop. Now, there are fine-grained models within evolutionary psychology, and they're really so fine-grained that in a 20-minute talk, I can't really delve into them too deeply. But they can elucidate why our, potential, our propensity for symbolic cognition is adaptive. And one of, I want to just, to illustrate that, I just want to give you a, an, an analogy, which is a kind of oversimplification of the problem. But if ritual makes unseen symbols real, and visionary experience can make hidden realities visible, there is something in human sexual behavior that has precisely that relationship, and it is menstruation. Menstruation, actually human female reproductive behavior in a primate context is really quite strange, in that there are no signals of fertility at all. No signals of estrus. Right? If you, you watch chimpanzees, when uh, a chimpanzee female comes into estrus, it's a major event for her body, and everyone in the troop knows about it. This is concealed to such an extent in human beings that menstruation, which kind of signals that somewhere soon fertility might just happen, fertility is made visible, an unseen fertility is made visible through menstruation. So what I'm doing here is I'm throwing open an image of humanity which is much wider than one that psychedelic consciousness might imply. What I'm trying to understand here through the realm of symbolic cognition is a much more holistic image of the human whereby visionary experience could possibly depend or have its origin in reproductive behaviors. Thank you. Uh, another really interesting one is that to, um, for language to evolve, we need the whites of our eyes. I don't have time to go in into that, but it's a really counterintuitive situation. The whites of your eyes allow you to see where I'm looking, which engenders trust. Language is fundamentally about trust. So there are wider issues to understand about visionary experience than just what it is, or what our cognition is, or how consciousness operates. It communicates with our sexual behavior as humans. What does all this mean for us in the 21st century? I mean, I've really only listed stuff rather than going into any detail, but collective unrealities and expect expectations of hidden worlds and things making hidden, visible things making hidden things appear, appears to be something that operates on every level of the human being. Neurology, 
culture, language as an unseen world of reference, reproductive behaviours. The unfolding of unseen worlds of reference can also be seen in language, and the drive to express them in artistic, embodied and dramatic form is ubiquitous across humanity. I think the evidence suggests that vision does not provide an evidential report into a hidden reality. Not a literal one, anyway. But that does not necessitate a strict cult of reason in which it must be dismissed as unreal or irrational. The prefrontal cortex appears to transcend this modern artificial boundary of reason and unreason, since both the scientific method and the visionary approach to living both deeply benefit from the stuff that the prefrontal cortex does. It's the method by which scientific theses are brought into conception and the driving force be behind the pervasive sense of meaning and intentionality in visionary experience. And, for many visionaries, that same intentionality projected out into the world in our daily lives. Unreality operates at every level of the human being. And I think to come to terms with ourselves as holistically and with genuine wellness of mind and body and of spirit, however you conceive that to be, these subjectively collective fictions, these paradoxes, need to be integrated into our self-understanding. Visionary artists are well-placed to affect this kind of integration in a realm where fact, non-fact, or belief and non-belief are less useful than dynamics of relevance, of experience, of imagination, and of creativity. I'm talking here about cognitive fluidity. The ability to be and think and believe and embody and live more than one thing at the same time. Humans are flexibly intelligent and to be honest, literalism and dismissal do not answer to the full capacity of that flexible intelligence. My rising feeling over the past few years has been that we are now in a position in the early 21st century to creatively centre all of these magical hidden worlds, unrealities and shimmering animisms upon ourselves in a movement away from that otherness that Rudolf Otto talked about, this visionary otherness, into a kind of sacred intimacy. Hidden worlds within us, in which we can delight in a deeper and more holistic image of an evidentially inquiring, symbolically perceiving, materialistic but otherworldly, paradoxical and experiential, sacred human being. Thank you very much.